All right, what's up, everybody? It's Valor Sachs here. Welcome to the channel. I'm going to talk about the top five things that I ultimately hate the most about cruise ships, but I do feel like if I'm going to go into something like this, I need to give you a quick premise on what inspired me to even make a video like this. It's been four years since I actually quit cruise ships and I worked on cruise ships for 21 years. Now, what will make a guy just quit? Well, let me start here. I worked on three different cruise lines and I got fired from two of them. And I got fired the worst possible way you can get fired. And I got fired the second worst way you can get fired. The number one worst way you can possibly get fired is when you do not know that you've actually been fired. Now, what in the world does that mean? Did you just show up to work and worked and didn't get a check? Like what? On cruise ships, you sign a contract to work from a starting date to a finishing date. While you're on that contract, you try to secure work for the next contract. Now, when they don't offer you any contracts anymore, you've been shadow fired. That's my name for it. When you get fired and you just don't know it. Now, when you work on a cruise ship, I don't care how great your evaluation is. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how long you've been working for a company. They are under absolutely no obligation whatsoever to ever rehire you again. Once you finish your contract, you are effectively done, which is why you want to secure it before your next contract. Now, I worked on this one cruise line. I'm not going to tell you the names of any of these cruise lines because I'm going to say terrible things about them. I worked on this cruise line for nine years. And when it came time for me to re-up, I was on a 10-month contract. So after about three months, I started asking around, hey, with my next contract, I want to get it going. 10 months go by, nothing. Make things even worse, when I got there, the alto saxophone position, once that guy left, once his contract finished, they cut the position. The trombone player got drunk in the bar because the bar would close early. People would run to the bar. Bar would close at like 1 o'clock in the morning. People would go to the bar at like 12.30, 12.45 and buy like 15, 20 drinks. This dude proceeded to buy and drink all of them. <laughs> Ultimately, they wound up taking him down to his cabin. Security went in to go check on him. He got out of bed, started taking a swing at security. They just let him sleep it off. And the next morning, he woke up fired and couldn't remember anything that happened. It's too bad. He was a good dude. The other guy, the, trump the trumpet player, he was the musical director. This dude was notorious for having serious problems with alcohol. And he started out pretty good. He went like the first three or four weeks totally clean. He was a little weird, though. But then he started drinking again. And the dude just turned into an absolute maniac. Drunk on the bandstand. On the gig. On stage where we had to stand up. He's leaning on the scaffold, just wakes up and starts counting the song off in the middle of a monologue that the guest singer is singing. It's one of the production singers. The whole band just looks at him like, I give the cruise director backstage the dirtiest stink eye because this guy had been like this for weeks. It's like, hey man, you see what's going on. The guy made me play everything. And I'm going to get to that because that's one of the things that's on my list. I was the guy that didn't get fired. Apparently, no more contracts for you. So you get shadow fired. I went four months without any work. Sold my other alto saxophone. Sold my soprano saxophone. Sold a bunch of mouthpieces. I sold a piccolo. I sold all kinds of stuff, man. Just to try and find work, I wound up going to a different company. And then... I worked there for 10 years. And then they fired me for being too fat. It's the second worst way you can get fired. Failing your medical. And I am not talking about, you know, you were using illicit drugs or anything like that. But your BMI is too high. So now you can't renew your medical on the ship. You have to go off the ship to the company approved medical facility. They lost my urine sample. And then they lost my entire medical. And to make matters even worse, I went three and a half to four months with no work there when all those hurricanes hit Florida in 2017. So I was kind of stuck and I had just enough money to get out of Florida. But 
I put my alto saxophone up for sale. I put my soprano saxophone up for sale because I was just out of work. They just kicked me off the ship. Your medical is now expired. You're done. You can't be on here. Sold a whole bunch of mouthpieces. I only just a couple years ago replaced that alto saxophone with this one. Now, here's the sick part of the whole thing. The company approved doctor at the company approved medical facility cleared me to come back. Like after a week, I went three and a half to four months. No job. Okay, so I wound up getting back with that company and then I later wound up quitting. So let's get to the five reasons that I find are the most disturbing reasons that I just absolutely despise cruise ships. Keep in mind, I did work there for 21 years and it wasn't always this bad. <laughs> it wasn't. Okay, let's get to it. Okay, coming in at number five, we have flags of convenience. Now, a flag of convenience, you've probably heard this before, is basically the cruise line being able to change the rules on the fly in order for them to do whatever it is they want to do. An example would be if in the United States, the legal drinking age is 21. But let's say I'm throwing a mad party and I want 18 year olds to be able to drink at my house and on my property. So you know what I do? I go out to my front yard and I take myself a Canadian flag because certain parts of Canada, I think you can drink at 18. And I take that flag and I just hoist it up. And now you can drink at 18 on my property. And this is essentially what cruise ships do. They basically find out what the rules and what the laws are in other companies. And then they register the ship. I'm sorry, in other countries. And then they register the ship in those countries. Now, it makes a lot of sense to do that if your ship is permanently out of said country, like Japan, for instance. There's a lot of ships that are just docked out of Japan and that's their home port. So what good would it do any of the Japanese people that are cruising if they have to abide by American law that they know nothing about? So, of course, you can restructure things like that. Obviously, the cruise lines have gamed the system. So why is that bad? Why, how does that really affect me as a crew member? Well, here's the thing. When it comes to labor laws in the United States, we have set policies on salary. When I left cruise ships in 2019, the starting pay for a musician in the orchestra was $1,800 to $2,100 a month. When I started cruise ships back in 1998, the starting pay was $1,800. So all they got to do is just not hire people from this country anymore because they require too much money. And they'll just hire people where that $1,800 is a lot of money. Like, for example, I know this is a little bit sensitive right now, but this was before all the war stuff started happening. I worked with a lot of Ukrainians. And back in 2019, the average monthly salary in U.S. dollars in Ukraine was less than $300 U.S. per month. That's six times they can start six times their national average and a lot of them started at twenty one hundred dollars which is seven times their country's own national average i'm not talking about musicians no i'm talking about musicians lawyers doctors teachers judges firefighters military everybody the average for the citizen of ukraine three hundred dollars a month less than that so Imagine there's this magical place called Bitcoinia and I can go work for a cruise line as an American that's from Bitcoinia and they're going to pay me seven times the U.S. national average, which is around six thousand dollars a month. I can start playing saxophone on a cruise line at forty two thousand dollars. I can't blame any of them for what they were getting. But where does that leave me to, to, to negotiate anything? Nowhere. It was gut-wrenching. It was heartbreaking. I was like, man, this is why my salary was so terrifyingly low after 21 years of working on cruise ships. And no, I'm not going to tell you what it was. It's too embarrassing and it's too heartbreaking. <laughs> okay. Now, that obviously takes us to number four, which is bad pay. Bad pay. The pay is terrible. If you come from 
a country whose dollar value is equal to or greater than that of the United States of America because their base pay is in general outside of the music. It's set to whatever country you're from so they can adjust all of that more flags of convenience stuff. Now, there were some gigs there like cruise director or if you are a fly on entertainer, those paid really really well. As a fly-on guest entertainer, you could be making, in fact, when I left the worst acts that I had played with in my life that were starting, we're getting $7,000 a week. But that's literally a one-man show. You bring in all your music on as a solo act, and then you rehearse that with the orchestra for a couple of hours, and then you do a couple of shows. Sometimes three shows, depending on the size of the theater. Okay, so let's get to number three. Number three is hiring inept people. When the cruise line hires inept people, that means you have to compensate for what they can't do. Now, if you've ever taken a cruise, ever been on a cruise, or if you've ever worked on a cruise, you know that depending on where you are, I mostly cruised with an American audience, with an English speaking audience. Most of the people that work on the cruise ships do not speak English as a first language. And when it comes to emergency and safety duties, because they don't speak English well, you essentially have to cover for them. So they wind up giving you extra duties in order to compensate. But people generally tend to get lazy and the cruise line generally tends to just milk it for everything it's worth. So you wind up having a phenomenal amount of extra duties aside from just going on the ship and playing your saxophone. Now, I wound up being a lifeboat commander. I I think my certificate might still be valid. It might not be, but at least something like that I could probably use on land if I want to get some type of, at any rate. I also worked with people who were mentally inept. And I mean this in a very sensitive way. Some of these people had absolutely no business whatsoever setting foot on a cruise ship. I worked with a guy that was in a band. I'm going to I'm not going to tell you what country he's from. I'm not going to tell you his name, but he was a guitar player. I don't know how he managed to do it, but this guy pissed off every single department that worked on the ship. And I had to take over for his job because they were stuck. The reason why he got promoted is because the company pissed off the guy who was his boss. So he was like, "Okay, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to promote this guy. His English was really bad, really bad. It was bad enough for him to not have even gotten hired, let alone actually be a supervisor. And this dude, I mean, wow, he could not conduct a band. He could not lead a band. He had no business skills. He had no computer skills. I mean, it was just a complete and utter disaster and it caused a lot of problems. I also worked with this guy who worked in housekeeping and this guy, he was just threatening to, you know, like to people. (laughs) He got into an argument with the sound guy in the bar and this guy was clearly out of his mind. He just started taking a lighter and striking it against random people. Like, how did this guy get hired? Hiring inept people. I've been on cruise ships where people didn't get to go home. That's the nicest way that I can say it. I'm not going to go into detail because some of those people were never found. In the 21 years that I've worked on cruise ships, there's probably been about 10 people that got on the ship and didn't get off. Hiring inept people. Man, okay. Number two, you get punished for being good. If you're really good at your job, they're going to want you to do everything. Now, as a saxophone player, as a sideman in the orchestra, you want to do your best. You want to play your best. And if you're good, they're going to want you to play everything. I'm a soloist. I'm a tenor player. You guys have seen all the stuff that I'm doing. So you know what? The other guys in the band wind up doing nothing. You get salaried. And when you're salaried, it doesn't matter if you work 15 hours a week or if you work 52 hours a week, your pay is exactly the same. So the company will want to work you as much as humanly possible. They'll basically want to work you until people start to quit. And then they know, okay, there's the limit. 
They want to work singers until they can't sing anymore. And then they know that's the limit to what we can work singers. And then they wind up getting stuff in their contract that stopped them from doing it. But being a grunt, being a musician, they will try to work you 40 hours a week. The last ship that I was on, I wound up working 52 hours a week to make the same money for the second to the last ship that I was on. Where I was working 15 hours a week. They try to trick you. They'll they'll ask you, what do you want to play? What do you guys love, man? We're, you know, this is your dream. You're out here living the dream. What do you like to play? And you, like a dumbass, will fall for it. You'll be like, yeah, man, let's put together this Coltrane set. And then we'll do like a little bit of Stevie Wonder. And you do it. And it works great. They bill it nicely in the in the daily paper. People see it and they're like, ah, let's check this out. And then the cruise director was like, hey, that set you guys did, that was great. But not enough people got to see it and they complained. So can you do two of them? And you're like, okay, we'll do two sets. Five weeks later, you're doing nine sets. And now everybody hates it because you're an amateur. And you shouldn't have agreed to do it in the first place. Now, when I took over way back as a musical director, I figured this out because they did it when the other guy was in charge. So I was like, if I ever take over, I ain't doing nothing extra. I'm doing the absolute bare minimum. I used to openly tell people, hey, man, I want you to do the absolute bare minimum. Make these people pay you to do more work. But you get punished for being good because they're going to make you do everything. And in fact, that drunk trumpet player that I was talking about, this guy was passed out all the time. I had to play all the sets. He just did like a quintet thing because he and the other guy was drunk together all the time. So I wound up playing all these sets. Anyway, number one, the number one reason why I quit ultimately comes down to this. Been there, done that. After 21 years, really after like six years, I'd been everywhere I wanted a cruise ship to take me. I'm going to show you guys a quick slide reel of me from about 100 pounds ago. <laughs> but at any rate, this was... Uh, back in the early 2000s, I started in 1998, and I think these pictures go up to about 2005, something like this. But at any rate, there's a reason why I did it for as long as I did. I got to see all these places. Like I said earlier, pretty much after every contract, I was mentally done. I was like, I quit. I don't want to do this anymore unless I get to go to South America and go to Rio de Janeiro during Carnival. They sent me straight there. After that, I was like, man, this was great. But I don't want to do this anymore unless I get to go to the Mediterranean. Unless I get to go to Egypt. Unless I get to see the Acropolis and the Colosseum. Sent me straight there. Then after a while, I pretty much seen all of it. And after a while, it was just a job. These places didn't look so special anymore. Anyway, that's my two cents. I'm also simultaneously working on a video about... What I loved about working on cruise ships, man, the best things, because when it was hot, it was the best thing ever, ever. (laughs) But at any rate, if you like this kind of content, you want to hear more of this kind of stuff, you want to support the channel, you can buy me a piece of cake. It's like a Kickstarter, Patreon type of thing that really helps the channel grow. Also have some products here that I use and I have an affiliate link with Woodwind Brasswind. That is absolutely by far the best way you can help support the channel is to use those links that uh, if you want to purchase any of those products. And no, you do not pay extra because you're using my link. You pay the same amount of money. Okay. Uh, I also have my Altissimo books for alto and tenor. My tenor sax is for sale, by the way. I will post a number down in the link. Um, But I do have those for sale. And I also have my All Things Diminished book for sale. And I have my uh, saxophone sound development book that is available for all saxophones. So... Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sticking with me, ladies and gentlemen. I just need to get that off my chest and vent a little bit because it's been like four years since I worked on cruise ships. But at any rate, that's all I got for you. Thanks for tuning in. See ya!